Did you know there's actually different types of soil organic carbon? So when we talk about soil organic carbon, we're not just talking about one component in our soil, we're actually talking about a whole range of different substances in our soils, and each of those different components of our soil organic carbon have different functions in our soil. So today in this video, we're going to be talking about these different uh, components that make up soil organic carbon. We're going to be talking about their function, why they're important to the functioning of our soil, what we can do to improve them, um, and all of that good stuff. Real quick, my name's Till Simmons. I run this channel, Agriculture Explained, as well as my consulting business, Agrisol. I make these for free to help you on your farm. And if you want, I can help you regenerate your farm and build soil health uh, with a bit of consulting. Otherwise, everything's for free. I also have a free uh, course on soil organic carbon, so you can check that out. The link should be here or um, floating around the video somewhere. Cool, so let's get into it. So soil organic carbon as a whole is made up of a range of different factors. So they include dissolved organic matter, humus, living organisms, fresh residue, and resistant organic matter. So let's start off with the smallest component of our soil organic carbon, and that is our dissolved soil organic matter. Now this are things like root extradate, which a root produces to feed microbes. It, can, it contains carbon that can dissolve in water. So this can include things like sugars, which are used as food for our microbes. So even though it makes up a tiny percentage, only 5%, this component is very important to understand the quality of our overall carbon stock. And the reason for this is that our dissolved soil organic matter increases with our better practices. So we mistreat our soils. Typically, the first go is that dissolved organic matter. And things like humus and resistant organic matter tend to degrade over time slowly. So a almost leading indicator that we can look for when looking at our soil health kind of indicators is our dissolved organic matter or water extractable carbon in our soil. If we've got a lot there, we know that we're going to be building carbon elsewhere. If we don't have much um, dissolved organic matter, then it's probably looking like we're losing carbon stock. So again, this only makes up 5%, so it's a very small amount, but very important for microbial activity. So the more dissolved organic matter we have, the more food there is available, or quick food that is available for our microbes, which means it's a good indicator for microbial activity as well. So in terms of how long that dissolved um, carbon lasts for, it's really only in our soils for minutes to days as our microbes eat um, this carbon source. And really this isn't, this isn't gonna to contribute too much to our long-term carbon stores, but really it's just to boost our um, microbial activity. So there's a very strong link between activity and the amount of dissolved uh, organic matter in our soils. So next in our pool of soil organic carbon is our living organisms. So this is things like bacteria, fungal, protozoa, nematodes, uh, all microbes make up this component. Now out of all our soil organic carbon, it makes up about 10% of our soil organic carbon. And remember too, these are just rough figures that might vary uh, in different soils and different management types. Um, this is a rough figure. So if you don't know too much about uh, soil microbes, I've got some other videos on that you can go check out. Effectively, they bring a lot of activity to our soil. So the bigger the pool is of our living or, uh, organisms or, or microbes, the more active our soil is going to be. So that's going to be things like decomposition or um, supplying nutrients to our plants, things like um, mycorrhizal fungi. That's really important. And so the bigger our biomass of living organisms are, is better for our soil. Next we have fresh residue. So this is things like decomposed um, plant, animal material. It's, it can be like roots, litter, um, manure, anything that was once living and it's broken down into um, little parts. Now, when we consider fresh residue and living organisms, so that slice is considered as particulate um, organic matter. Now these two slices are able to be used by microbes for food. So for example, microbes, some microbes eat other microbes, so it's a source of food. When microbes die, they turn into fresh residue, uh, which can then be consumed by other microbes. So typically, this component of our soil organic carbon is a bit larger than our dissolved soil organic matter. But when we can factor all these in, so it's about 25% of our soil organic carbon, we get labile carbon. And this is anything that microbes can readily use uh, for energy. Now, you might want to think of this as like active carbon in our soil. It's actually it can be used for different functions by our microbes. And so it's really important to have a labile carbon component in our soil so that our microbes can function. 
Again, this has a really fast turnover, so the dissolved organic matter has a turnover of minutes to days, so very quick. Our fresh residue is a bit longer, and that's about two to 50 years. So a lot longer, it depends on what the material is. So if it's like legume um, uh, material, or if you have a, a cover crop of legumes, that can, that's gonna decompose a lot faster because of the high nitrogen component than say um, a hardwood, um, which might take, you know, the full 50 years or even more to break down. So low vial carbon as a whole also gives us an idea of the quality of our soil organic carbon and whether or not we're going to be building soil organic carbon uh, in the long term. So if we compare two soils and one has a greater pool of low vial carbon, it might suggest that we're going to be building soil organic carbon and, and growing that pie. Whereas if we have a smaller uh, low vial carbon pool, it might suggest that we're burning more carbon uh, in our soil and not contributing to our stable soil organic matter. On the other side of labile carbon, we have our stable organic matter. This includes re uh, resistant organic matter and humus. Now humus makes up the biggest component of our soil, 60%, it's a massive component, and it's very difficult to explain what humus is, simply because there is no chemical formula which describes um, humus. It's a very complex um, polymer of carbons pieced together by different microbes. So if you're familiar with Dr. Christine Jones's work, she explains the um, humification pro process um, as done by mycorrhizal fungi when they eat root extradates. And so what happens is root extradates are produced by a plant, mycorrhizal fungi and some other fungi um, effectively eat or process these root extradates into a very complex chain of carbon in our soil. So this carbon is quite active biologically, physically and chemically in our soil has a very high cation exchange capacity as well as anion exchange capacity. So it holds onto nutrients uh, really effectively, has a high capacity to store and hold water, um, while also effective at releasing that water to our plants. So we'll have another video in the future about the humus and the benefits that humus brings to our soil, um, or you can check out our free soil organic carbon course. In terms of the half life for humus, it's around 10 to 100 years, so a lot a lot longer than our labile carbon. Now one of the massive benefits that humus has is it holds together our soil particles. So when we have high amounts of humus, um, which is quite active in terms of its physical properties and chemical properties, it can hold clay particles and soil aggregates together, forming that really nice crumbly soil that you might see on someone like Gabe Brown's farm. Now finally, we have resistant organic matter. So this can be things like uh, charcoal or um, biochar. And this is really inert uh, pieces of carbon. So it doesn't have as many benefits as humus and only makes up around 15% of our soil. If you're thinking about building soil organic carbon this way, it stores it for a really long time, which is great. And the turnover for resistant organic matter is about 100 to 1,000 years. So it's a much longer um, time frame for that. It doesn't break down uh, easily but it's quite inert, so it doesn't really have the benefits that humus has. Now, it still does have benefits, so it does have uh, a pretty high CEC and anion exchange capacity, it has water holding capacity, but it's not as effective as humus, and it's hard to build. It's hard to build resistant organic matter, especially when you're trying to apply biochar. I think I did a calculation, and it takes like 60 massive trees to build 1% um, soil organic carbon if you're applying um, biochar. Whereas with humus, you can build humus quite rapidly with these root extradates um, that we talk about in the course, but effectively plants yeah, produce those root extradates and you can do that en masse by planting either cover crops or perennial pastures. And that gets converted with mycorrhizal fungi into humus. That's effectively it for the components of our soil organic carbon. Now, finally, it's important to note that the mineral component or the mineral carbon in our soil is not considered a soil organic carbon for it to be considered as soil organic carbon, it has to come from an organic source or once living. So that's basically plants and animals or microbes. So when we have things like uh, calcium carbonate, which is, which is a mineral, that's not soil organic carbon. It's, and the amount of that in your soil depends on your soil's um, parent material. So sometimes you can get high amounts of gypsum or lime in your soil, uh, naturally occurring. Um, but really, you're not, that doesn't really have the same benefits that our soil organic carbon has. Now to measure all of this, what we do is we use a hanging test um, and there should be a uh, picture popping up here. 
But effectively, you can get our dissolved organic matter with the water extractable uh, carbon from our water, and, and we can determine the exact amount of dissolved organic matter in that. We get our lay-by carbon, um, and then we can determine this proportion, our particular proportion of our um, labile carbon by subtracting our dissolved organic matter. And they also have the total soil organic carbon uh, on the test, and we can determine the state of our soil organic carbon by um, factoring out or subtracting our labile carbon out of that. And then what we can also do from this is we can look at the proportion of labile carbon to stable or total um, soil organic carbon to determine the, almost the quality and the trend that we're heading in for our soil organic carbon. And if you are interested in this, go check out the courses for free. There's no email opt-in or anything. It's just go to our website. You can go watch the courses. It's also on YouTube if you don't want to go to the website. Otherwise, if you're a New South Wales farmer, I can help you with this um, with our consulting program. Awesome. Thanks very much for watching. My name is Till Simmons. This is Agriculture Explained. Cheers.